Now, we would like to start today's program first uh, from the International Institute of Strategic Studies. Uh, uh, Chairman Bill Emmott will give a keynote, keynote speech. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great honor to have been invited to not just to take part in this first Tokyo Global Dialogue organized by the Japan Institute for International Affairs, but also an even greater honor to be asked to give a keynote speech on this second day of the conference. In doing so, however, I've committed one immediate sin by choosing as the title of my keynote something that is self-regarding because I've based the title on the title of a book that I published in 2017 called The Fate of the West. One point that may nevertheless be interesting is that when my Japanese publisher translated the book, it insisted on using a different title. Instead of The Fate of the West, my publish publisher opted instead to use the end of the West, <laughs> Seyo no Owari. It did add a subtitle, which made clear that this was not a prediction, but rather a rhetorical question. But even so, the choice was striking. Two years later, with President Emmanuel Macron having described the fundamental need, means of transatlantic security cooperation, NATO, as brain dead, with President Donald Trump demanding a five-fold increase in payments for military expenses from its South Korean, from America's South Korean alliance partner, and with the World Trade Organization dispute settlement system becoming essentially non-functional thanks to the United States blocking appointments to its appellate body, perhaps Seo no Owari is proving to be the better title. Today, I do not intend to be quite so pessimistic. I continue to believe that the network of relationships and collaboration between liberal democracies remains strong enough to survive particular administrations and to overcome particular events. But as this Tokyo Global Dialogue noted during its first day, that network is becoming looser is being challenged by new impulses in some key member countries and is anyway struggling to confront the new geopolitical reality of the world. Moreover, I hope to mitigate my sin of choosing my own book title by bringing to bear also a view of recent developments from Britain, a country whose political decisions and whose political paralysis have contributed to some of the weakening of what I see as the successful idea of the West. This view has been broadened, I suppose, by the fact that although definitely British by citizenship, I now live in Ireland as an exile from Brexit, a Brexile, <laughs> and so feel imbued with a thoroughly European way of thinking. And while our deliberations have necessarily so far focused chiefly on political developments, I hope to offer a narrative more rooted in political economy, hopefully providing a bridge to the more economics-centered discussions that will follow this keynote. These days, as has been noted already in this conference, we all talk about threats to what we call the liberal rules-based order. Yet arguably 10 and certainly 20 or 30 years ago, these phrases were not widely used. Yes, we contrasted liberal states from illiberal ones, but whether or not the world order was or was not based on rules was less of a concern. Some of it was, some of it wasn't. Certainly after 1945, the United States led the establishment of a series of multilateral institutions, many of them revolving around the United Nations. But this is not really what defined the world order, helpful though many of the institutions and related agreements were. What defined the world order was, as we said yesterday, the superpower divide between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
It was a dual superpower world in which other countries either took sides or else tried to seal themselves off as autarkic, neutral, or at least non-aligned nations. Those institutions that did exist and did matter were all controlled by the United States and by European countries with very few exceptions. Moreover, the United States often chose to ignore, bypass, or simply not ratify the very rules that it played a key role in initiating. Rules were for other countries. The United States considered itself exceptional, and of course, still does. The end of the Cold War in 1989 to 91 brought that world order to an end, which is why President George H.W. Bush made his famous or to some notorious speech calling for a new world order. What emerged was a world in which power was more dispersed and in which a renewed effort was made to establish rules in the form of international law and international forms of dispute settlements through new courts, whether for trade disputes or war crimes. Again, the United States often brokered the new rules and institutions, but kept a distance from them itself. Suddenly, this was no longer a world in which countries had to choose sides. It was a world in which shared ideas and networks became more important. During the Cold War, the West was a term used in opposition to the East, which was not Japan or even Asia, but rather Russia and its Soviet allies, and membership of the West was a largely pragmatic affair, not always corresponding to liberalism or democracy. But during the 1990s and beyond, this changed. The West became, I would argue, less a pragmatic or a geographical concept and more an, I an idea, the I an idea of the value of open, liberal, democratic societies and of how to protect and nurture their prosperity and society through collaboration. It was a world, therefore, in which that ever-expanding supranational body of law and treaty-based collaboration, the European Union, could and did play an enhanced role. The EU was in fact seen by many as a model for the future. The West became, in other words, a network of shared interests and shared ideals reinforced by rules and institutions. Regardless of geography, Japan is certainly a member of that network, as is Taiwan, as is South Korea, as is Chile, as of course is the European Union. The most difficult member of the network is, and always has been, its progenitor, the United States. To those who say that the US has become a, quotes, unreliable partner these days, the correct response is to point out that actually it has always been unreliable, in the sense that it acted unilaterally, sometimes unpredictably, often self-centeredly. During my years as chief editor of The Economist in the 1990s and early 2000s, we were always writing about crises in transatlantic relations. The crises were genuine, but never risked being fatal. As has been widely noted, the difference now is that American unreliability has become more extreme, but also it has become laced with active hostility towards its own allies. We in Europe are used to America supporting the European Union, not attacking it. To America fostering NATO and leading it, even if nagging our governments along the way, rather than undermining it as now. But let's step back for a moment and look at the background to this. As we approach the third decade of the 21st century, the post-Cold War picture of the West has not just been disturbed by new behaviors and personalities, but by two great events, or perhaps they should be described as two great realities. The first is the 2008 financial crisis the greatest financial collapse for 80 years. The second, of course, is the emergence of a new dual superpower world, that of the United States and China, which has a fundamental difference to the Cold War world of 1945 to 91. The 2008 financial crisis weakened most of the countries that formed the Western, Western network internally in more profound and more long-lasting ways than most people except perhaps the Japanese, who had had their own financial crash, understand. We underrate the influence of the financial crisis at our peril. It is the crucial background to our current fragmentation and fractiousness. 
11 years later, virtually all G7 countries and virtually all the member states of the European Union have recovered in terms of absolute levels of output and of, uh, and of employment. Italy is the most notable exception with real household incomes and indeed overall output still lower than before 2008. But all of the G7 countries still nevertheless bear deep scars economically and therefore politically. One of those scars is in the public finances. At a time when other long-term forces such as demographic change and the need to adjust to industrial change caused mainly by automation but also by global competition would normally have demanded policy responses involving extra public spending, Western governments' public finances became overwhelmed by the task of preventing financial systems from collapsing and of replacing contracting private activity through public support. This greatly reduced the resources available to deal either with inequality or, more pressingly, job displacement. That is one of the reasons also why economic recovery has been so patchy and so partial. The pressure on public finances caused by demography will continue to be a major issue. For the great plus or benefit of our extended lifespans and long retirements also means that the largest part of public spending consists of pension entitlements, which re represent a transfer of resources from, from the young to the old. That transfer has many merits, but one effect is to reduce the amount of taxpayers' money that is readily available either for spending on education or for such new welfare ideas as universal basic income. Economic recovery has not been fully affected, uh, sorry, reflected in any widespread feel-good factor. This is explained in part by continued high levels of underemployment in many countries, including the United States, of people employed but working for fewer hours or in lower skilled jobs than they would like, levels that also help to explain low rates of earnings growth. And it is felt in perceptions about widened economic inequality, perceptions which are not always borne out by the data, but which nevertheless represent a widespread feeling of unfairness, which seems in fact related less to incomes or wealth than to a much increased feeling of insecurity. Levels of employment may be high again in many countries, but larger numbers of people than before feel they are in insecure jobs. Japan, of course, was the forerunner in this regard. The rise from 20% of the workforce in 1990 to almost 40% now of the proportion of employees working in non-regular jobs on short-term contracts and on a part-time basis represents a rise in flexibility, a reduction in labor costs for companies, but also a big increase in the insecurity associated with employment. Similar trends can be seen more recently in Italy, France, Spain, Germany, and other European countries. We know that insecure employment is not a new phenomenon historically, but it is certainly a new phenomenon in modern post-war times. We know that technology is also playing a part in this development, and we know that neither flexibility nor insecurity are entirely bad. However, it is clear that the 2008 crash did great direct harm to people's faith in liberal free market economic systems and in the political systems that were supposed to be responsible for overseeing them. And it did deeper longer term harm to people's sense of security, a harm leading some to be tempted by alternative ideas about how to provide protection resuscitated from a more nationalistic past. Brexit might be considered a case study of this phenomenon. To understand Britain's vote in 2016 to leave the European Union after 43 years of membership, you have to hold in your mind two things. First, the harm done to voters' faith in both economics and politics in what was, what was one of the epicenters of the 2008 financial crisis. And second, the long-standing feeling of detachment shading into indifference held by many Britons about Europe. Established policy and economic ideas are as tarnished and discredited in Britain as they are in other advanced countries. 
It is certainly true that Britain's economic condition improved greatly during its membership of the EU, both thanks to domestic reforms and thanks to the constraints and opportunities provided by EU membership. But 43 years of economic history were not enough to convince those voters who felt that established economic and political ideas were no longer working well for them and for, both for their children, and who felt threatened by increased insecurity after the 2008 crash and by a rapid increase in immigration that had begun in 2004 with European Union enlargement but continued even after the financial crash and recession. Three and a half years later, Britain's economic performance has deteriorated following the referendum vote and the, and the country has been stuck in a long period of political paralysis. The politics of Brexit have sucked all of the oxygen out of the policy-making process. No convincing arguments have been found or even really made to show that leaving the European Union will make British people better off economically. And yet, despite that background, opinion polls currently show two contradictory pictures. They do show a consistent but small majority now in favor of remaining in the European Union of roughly the same plurality of 52-48 by which the nation voted to leave in 2016. But they also show that the Conservative Party, which has presided over this mess and created this paralysis over the, for the past eight years in office, looks quite likely to be re-elected in our general election on December the 12th, next week, next week, with a stronger position in Parliament so that it will, as our Prime Minister says in his main campaign message, get Brexit done. How to reconcile these contradictions? Well, to do so, I don't need to divert you too far into the weeds, into the granular details of British politics to explain, for example, that the principal opposition party is led by a man who only last week was accused by the UK's chief rabbi of permitting a virus of anti-Semitism to spread in his Labour Party, an accusation that highlights Jeremy Corbyn's weaknesses as a leader. What I mainly need to explain is the British attitude to Europe. In our country, there is a hard core of true believers in membership in the EU and all the strategic and practical gains it brings, and there is also a hard core of people who are deeply hostile to the sharing of our sovereignty with foreign countries that EU membership entails, bringing as it does an apparent interference in UK affairs by distant political and judicial forces. But in between these rival groups, there is a large pool of people who simply do not care very much about the issue. They are indifferent. They could be swayed by lies in, in campaigns and by recent events, most notably Europe's migrant crisis. So although in a new referendum, a, major a majority might now vote to stay in the EU, in our general election, it looks as if a majority will cast their vote for what looks to them to be the least untrustworthy and most credible of the rather poor set of options available. Too few people care enough about Europe for the election to be decided on that issue alone. Brexit is admittedly more a symbolic blow to the Western network, to the liberal rules-based order about which are, we are speaking, than a real one. It will weaken the EU and it will weaken Britain, but both will remain members of the Western network and both will remain firm backers of multilateral solutions. If British voters do vote next week to, quote, get Brexit done, most will do so on the assumption that in some form the United Kingdom will still be a close partner of the United States, of the European Union, and indeed of Japan. What we should note in Britain, as in many other European countries, is the new popularity since 2008 of political parties that are not firm backers of such multilateral solutions and of the West as a network. In Britain, that man who has achieved the electoral campaigning feat of being criticized by the chief rabbi, the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, is not only a longtime critic of Israel, but also of the United States. He is an opponent of NATO and of the West in general. Meanwhile, in Germany, 
party called Alternative for Germany, a far-right party that is especially strong in the former Eastern Germany, is opposed not only to immigration but also to many aspects of Germany's membership of the EU. And in Italy, the most popular party by far, Matteo Salvini's League, is also anti-immigrant, but also an open proclaimer of Italy first, a sympathizer with Vladimir Putin, and particularly with quite exclusionary Christian values. What does this signify? It signifies that in the wake of the 2008 crash, extremist and national, nationalist parties have prospered. They have not typically got into power, although in Italy, Austria, and Denmark, they have been, they have been included in coalition governments, but they nevertheless represent a rejectionist nationalist trend. This is not, in my view, best explained or understood as a reaction to globalization as such. It is better understood as a sign of disenchantment with the solutions offered by mainstream parties because those solutions brought about a deep financial crisis and failed to deal adequately with insecurity and with flows of refugees from war-torn or impoverished countries in the Middle East and Africa, the presence of which can also, in some sense, be ascribed to failed Western policies. Put together with the political situation in the United States, this signific signifies a general sense that democratic systems have either become dysfunctional or else downright corrupt. In part, the perception of corruption might be understood as a consequence of raised expectations and of greater knowledge than in the past. But also, it is a consequence, I believe, of a natural process in all democracies of the capture of policy-making processes and especially of tax, public spending, and regulation by powerful vested interests, by the force of money, in other words. What other general way to explain the 2008 crash than by an excessive influence over financial and monetary regulation by banks and other financial institutions themselves? This process is an inevitable and permanent feature of democracies. Inequalities of influence over policy rise over time, channeled through campaign finance, lobbying, the media, and other means, and have to be fought back periodically to maintain a sense of equality. It is rather the same with the tendency of markets towards concentration and oligopoly, which needs periodically to be fought back against by antitrust and other policies. The price of liberty, as Thomas Jefferson is often alleged to have said, is eternal vigilance. This is the weakness that we are seeing right now, and it is calling for a new vigilance that so far has not proven up to the task. That internal weakness, which both caused the 2008 crash and has since been exacerbated by it, is the background, I believe, to Brexit and Trump and to the rise of populist nationalists in other European countries. Candidate Trump called for the swamp to be drained and, of course, in office has extended and deepened the swamp rather than draining it. So far, I do not think that Italian, French, Spanish, or British voters believe that their particular swamps have been drained either. These remain politically volatile times. This means that the West will remain under danger because of its internal weaknesses. Japan has become a much somewhat stronger and more active partner especially a partner in building multilateral agreements and institutions, but other countries are acting in less positive ways. Yet we must all also recognize the second great reality of our times, the reality which we discussed yesterday, the return of a two superpower world of the United States and China. This changes the task for the West, but also complicates its existence as a network. During the Cold War, most countries could choose to take sides. With the US and China, all countries have instead to establish deep relationships, economic, commercial, political, cultural, with both America and China. And we should note that while from 1945 up until now, there was just one country which believed that it was so exceptional and powerful that it did not always have to obey the rules, even rules that it itself designed, there will now be two such countries. China's aspiration, it seems to me, is towards equality of respect and of rights with the United States. 
which means not only that it expects to play a key role in setting future rules, but also that it will reserve the right to ignore them. Meanwhile, other countries risk just becoming spectators as this G2 world develops, with either hostility or compromise between the two superpowers, both affecting us all. Having, having been active participants in the construction of rules and institutions, even if under American leadership, we all risk becoming rule takers. To paraphrase the old proverb, the grass, get, grets, the grass gets trampled whether the elephants fight or when they make love, and we are all grass now. Or, to put it a better way, we are all small or at best medium-sized countries now. It is just that some of us, especially in Europe, are not quite used to this idea. Moreover, recent developments both in China and the United States have placed a spotlight on another danger of excessive dependency on either country, especially for technology. Behind the controversy over Huawei and 5G telecoms is in reality a fear of becoming dependent on a single supplier for a crucial part of future digital infrastructure, a danger that may well be repeated with future technologies. Meanwhile, the American danger to us all is one of becoming part of a US technology monopoly or oligopoly, one in which tech giants such as Facebook and Google not only abuse their dominant, dominant positions in the marketplace, but also facilitate the abuse of our democracies. So our task, whether in post-Brexit Britain, in the European Union, in Japan, or indeed in ASEAN, has to be twofold. First, it must be to make ourselves economically, technologically, and politically stronger so that we become less vulnerable either to, to domestic upheavals and protests or to external bullying and so that our populations feel less insecure. And second, by joining together in new forms of the Western network to make both, to make both of the superpowers consider us as indispensable and not simply malleable. Secretary, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright liked to define America as, quotes, the indispensable nation. We in Europe and Japan need to define ourselves, to create ourselves as indispensable interlocutors, forces to be wooed as partners and not just pushed around. It'll be quite a difficult task, but we can do it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chair Mayamo. Now I'd like to open the floor. Arigato gozaimashita. Sore dewa floor o open itashimasu. Go shitsumon no aru kata wa kyoshi o onegai itashimasu. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. But before your question, please identify your name and affiliation. Thank you. Uh, Peter Jennings from uh, in Australia, Bill, and thank you for a great speech. Can you dig a little bit more into uh, President Macron's reference to NATO as brain dead? Is he just expressing frustration with the United States? And doesn't he risk creating a sort of uh, transatlantic unity around the theme that NATO is no longer relevant? Well, I think that's a very good question. I think, um, I think the reaction in Germany and other European countries to his comments uh, suggest exactly the second danger is in their minds, that they are worried if, if NATO is described as brain dead, the, the danger is that it may become physically dead as well uh, in their minds. I mean, what I think he meant was that the United States has for 70 years been a, played a key role in not only bring the, being the brain of NATO, the, the main driving force of it along with other countries, but also um, the coordinating uh, uh, engine of NATO and recent uh, events, particularly with Turkey and in Syria, he cited as being cases in which the coordination function had ceased to exist. And I think in his mind, extra to that uh, was that he was saying that the US is, is, has lost its faith in NATO. Now, the meeting today in uh, Britain for the 70th anniversary of NATO, uh, a, a meeting that has apparently been cut short in order to uh, <laughs> limit the amount of uh, possible controversy around it, um, and uh, I suspect that that does reflect that worry. Um, now, in, in Europe, the added agenda is the notion that Chancellor Merkel introduced in 2016, 2017, uh, that Europe needs to, quotes, 
take its fate into its own hands. In other words, to, uh, to become less dependent on the American brain uh, and American resources in NATO. But the fact is that we're roughly $400 billion a year away from being able to do that. In other words, we're, we're way below the capabilities where we could do that anyway. But so I think definitely European nations feel that they need to maintain and continue to invest in NATO and persuade the United States and the longer term administration of the United States that NATO continues to, to matter and that they matter, meanwhile, by, by investing in the defense. I, let, he, he, I suspect that um, he saw the, the phrase in French, and it was an interview in French, as probably having slightly less of a severe connotation than it did in the English translation, but, uh, but uh, there, there we are. We're all lost in translation in certain senses. Time is short, it's getting short, so we have to get to the last, uh, the, this was the last question, but I'd like to thank the, the Mr. Emmett very much for his wonderful lecture. Thank you.